This story is brought to your ears by all our fantastic supporters on Patreon. To get in on the action yourself with bloopers, extras, and the occasional early story, join us at patreon.com slash voiceofallmtg. For more stories, or just a chat, visit voiceofallmtg.com or our new Twitter, at voiceofallmtg. And now, Voice of All presents The Believer's Pilgrimage, Episode 3 of The Battle for Zendikar. Gideon Jura brought Jace Beleren to Zendikar in hopes that the Mind Mage could crack what the merfolk scholars of Seagate called the Puzzle of Ley Lines, the mystery of the network of stone hedrons that float in the skies of Zendikar. The hedrons are tied intimately to the Eldrazi, serving as lures, bonds, and, the scholars hope, weapons. But with Seagate fallen and the scholars' records lost, there may be only one place on Zendikar where Jace can get what he needs, and only one guide who's willing to help him get there. Jace pressed his forehead against a hedron, running his hand over its runes. The structure jetted out from the grass at an angle, mostly submerged in the earth, a slouching iceberg of stone. Strewn across the rocky fields, from here to the encampment, and to Seagate beyond that, were the bodies of slain Eldrazi, lying like jellyfish washed up on a beach. He sent someone approaching behind him, from the direction of the encampment. Jorianne, is it? And you're Jace. She was a tall merfolk, outfitted for the wilderness. She moved with the self-assured bearing of someone who had traveled Zendikar for years, but with the taut, careful look of someone who had witnessed devastation very recently. I'm here to share what I know. Good. Jace poked at a dead Eldrazi creature with his foot, its tissue deformed in colors of magenta and teal. He looked up at Jorian. People used to worship them as gods, didn't they? Some still do can't much blame them. We need to stop the problem at its root. Jory nodded. That's what the researchers hope to do at Seagate. Extinguish them. With the Hedron network? Yes. And you've had success using the Hedrons? I only saw some of their research, but I'll tell you everything I can remember. Jace focused his glance on a space just between Jory's eyes. I have a better idea. If you're amenable. Jace's consciousness toured Jory's mind, swimming through imagery of goblins strapping small hedrons to sticks, core warriors painting their faces to mimic hedron runes, and merfolk researchers at Seagate plying their magic on hedrons. He focused in on one memory in particular, a team of Zendikari, led by a human woman, using the magic of the hedrons to guide the Eldrazi creature's movements. The puzzle of ley lines. The woman, Kendrin, had been close to understanding something crucial about how the Hedron's magic could be used, and turned into a weapon against the Eldrazi. Unfortunately, Jace also saw the memory of Jory putting her hand on Kendrin's forehead as the dead woman's body crumbled into brittle ribs of grey dust. She had died to the Eldrazi slaughter before she could pass on enough of what she knew. Jace opened his eyes and sucked in a breath, emerging from Jorian's mind as if he were breaching the surface of an ocean. Jory was squatting above him, on top of the Hedron, looking down at him. That was fascinating. I could almost feel the second presence in my mind. Sometimes I can sense the person perceiving my perception of them. It's like catching my own reflection in the mirror. Sort of. So, do you know all my dark secrets now? I know Kendrin was close to something. But Jace also knew he couldn't yet solve the puzzle he was brought here to solve. He needed more, and he knew where he needed to go. Before he could explain, footsteps crunched toward them. Hello, Gideon. Jace and Jory turned to see Gideon's approach, sunlight pooling on the warrior's armor like liquid light. Tell me you have a breakthrough. We're close. We have to go to the Eye. The Eye of Ugin? 
You want to go all the way to Akum? It's the linchpin to the Hedron network. That's where we'll find the answer. No, absolutely not. We just established this encampment. We have injured. We can't go separating the group. We already have. Nissa left in the night. What? Why? I didn't talk to her. Only got surface thoughts as she left. I gathered she had a mission that was important to her. More important than solving the nature of the Hedrons? We have to focus on life and death here. I tend to agree. Come with us, Gideon. I am focusing on life and death. This place is life and death every minute. I can't... We can't afford another refugee death. I'm not leaving to protect you on a cross-country mission. You have Jory's account. Can't you solve it here together? I only have what they accomplished, not why it worked. Look, you're not seeing the bigger picture here. This is what I came here to do. Let me do it. If you leave the encampment, these people will die and so will you. If I don't get to the eye, everyone on this plane will die. Have you ever changed things while you were in there? Jay sat next to her as she drove a small coach pulled by a single herder. It was the best the encampment could spare. They rode out from the encampment without Gideon. Sometimes that becomes necessary. You could have removed my memory of her, for example. Of Kendron, of her death. Jace thought of Jory's hand touching the dead woman's forehead. It felt like his own hand in his memory. He could feel Kendron's skin, how it was too cool and too thin and dry to the touch. You didn't want that. But you could have. Yes. How do I know you didn't alter anything else? There's nothing you can say that will prove it to you either way, is there? I'm told I'm not an easy person to be friends with. Do you ever think about, you know, changing his mind? You could have made him a believer in the mission, couldn't you? He had thought about it, yes. One quick spell and he could have convinced Gideon to come. I consider every possibility. Not sure I'd have the same restraint you do. Seems like there'd always be possibilities he would never consider. He's hard to budge in more ways than one. The difference between us, I suppose. And yet you chose not to meddle with his mind. Maybe you're more alike than you think. Jace looked at the horizon beyond the pack beast that pulled the coach. If we were alike, he'd see the importance of the eye. He'd have devoted all of his resources into making sure we understand the Hedrons. He'd be here, with us. Jory flicked the reins as the land trailed by. You ever wonder what you'd be able to accomplish if there were just more of yourself around? Jay shook off thoughts of Gideon and let himself chuckle. He cast a quick illusion spell and three other Jaces appeared. The duplicate Jaces perched at odd angles on the herd's back, all identical in their blue cloaks. We wonder that frequently, they said in unison and disappeared. Jory gave him a skeptical smile and shook her head. It was days until they encountered any Eldrazi. They rambled past hedron-studded pastures, with knobby stone islands casting shadows down on them from the air above. They spoke little, and Jay struggled to piece together what he knew. He tried to find a reason they should turn back, a reason why their knowledge of the hedrons was somehow sufficient. He was probably even familiar enough with Seagate that he could planeswalk back there safely, via some other plane, but that would strand Jorien out here alone. When the swarm of Eldrazi spawn crested the hill and scrambled toward the two travelers, the sun was behind them and lights glinted off all the angular elbows and framed the blank cranial plates. Drive! Jory saw them, but cover was almost non-existent. Where? Anywhere! Jory yanked diagonally on the reins. Too hard. The herd snorted in revolt and threw its weight in the opposite direction, snapping the reins out of Jory's hands. 
Jace and Jory clung on as the coach jackknifed and tilted, and something cracked down by the wheels. The coach righted itself, but now was being pulled at the herd's whims. New plan, stop! You stop it! Before Jace could explain the folly of trying to mind-alter the beast, the herda slapped the ground with its paws and shifted its weight again, now turning directly toward the wave of advancing Eldrazi. That halted it. Jace and Jory lurched with the stopping coach. Seeing the creatures moving toward it, the herda slowly started backing up, pushing back into its own rigging, pushing back against the coach. The coach began to tilt, and something wooden was breaking. A core woman dashed past the coach, seemingly out of nowhere, holding sharp, curving grappling hooks. She leapt onto the rigging, ran up the herd's back, and jumped onto the ground between the pack beast and the scrambling Eldrazi. Jace could see that her skin was smudged with symbols in black grease, like hedron runes, but perhaps slightly different. Where the hell did she come from? The core woman looked at Jace and Jory, and without breaking eye contact with them, sliced through the herda's neck with one of the sharp hooks. With a bellow, the herda fell to the ground. She stood there, blood dripping from her hook, looking at them. Jace checked Jory's face to see his own mental state reflected back at him. Extreme alarm. Come with me. Hurry. They'll eat the animal first. With that, the woman bolted past them, heading toward a low hill. Jason Jory leapt down from the coach and ran after her, Jory grabbing a halberd from the coach and Jace grabbing nothing as usual. The core woman disappeared over the ridge and they followed her to the lip of a narrow chasm. The core woman had already deployed her lines and was repelling down into the fissure. Down here, quickly! Jace looked back. Sure enough, the herder was already being overwhelmed and torn to shreds by the Eldrazi creatures. I'm with her. Jory threw the halberd onto a strap on her back and launched herself down the ropes, heading down into the chasm. Jace had eight or nine distinct bad feelings about this, but he took hold of one of the lines and pulled himself down. He had a strange brainstorm of creating illusions of himself to climb alongside him. He imagined them losing their grip on the ropes and falling, and for some reason the thought was strangely comforting. Better them than him. The core woman helped him to the ground as Jory dusted herself off. I am Ailey. We must get you to Sanctuary. Hurry, please! Jason and Jory in exchanged another look, the facial equivalent of a desperate shrug. Ailey dashed through the narrow chasm, and they followed. They squeezed through the walls on either side of them. Some were defined by the flat surfaces of great hedrons. Other sections bare rock. They tried to hurry, which became increasingly difficult as they descended into shadow. Jace tried to keep close to Jory's back, his mind racing with fallback options as they got farther and farther from the coach. The chasm widened and the sky opened overhead. Jace's gaze arced up from Jory, who had stopped dead in her tracks, to the core woman, Eile, who stood serenely before them, her hands folded, to the wide swath hewn in the land ahead of them, edged with brittle gray dust, to the towering horror, the titan poised on a skirt of sinewy tentacles, the eyeless skulled deity with its great bifurcated limbs. Ulamog. Jace could barely move. The air felt wrong. He felt drawn forward somehow, as if gravity had shifted away from the earth and toward this thing. He felt like Krill drawn toward a whale's maw, sucked inevitably toward its consuming bristles. Welcome, offerings, to the sanctuary. The presence of the god Mangeni whose second name is Ula, whose voice sings the song of devouring, will be your final sanctuary. Jace turned to retreat, but he and Jory were surrounded. A dozen other priests stood between them and the gap in the chasm. They were all dressed alike, painted with dark, greasy streaks like Eile, and they all bore weapons. Two of them held lengths of thick iron chain. We are the eternal pilgrims. We shall forever roam. 
we shall forever roll. We present these world gifts in Ula's name. In Ula's name. Ulamog reached out with its tentacled bulk, grasped a quantity of earth, and then, horribly, began to drag itself forward. The sound of Ulamog's locomotion chilled Jace's soul. It was the sound of living earth having all its essence leached out of it, of fierce and wild mana being silenced forever, of rich terrain turning to desiccated bone. It was only for a moment, but Jace imagined his own body dissolving under Ulamog's mass, his tissues separating from each other, his flesh floating away from him like the floating islands of Zendikar. This was what was going to happen to the entire world. The Eldrazi Titan was consuming every flicker of energy on the plane. From the mana of the land to the individual lives, slowly and inexorably. In a flash, Jace perceived the pattern that would develop. The peoples of Zendikar would flee from the wasted lands, gathering together in places that could still support life, concentrating their number around defensive locations and landmarks. And in turn, Ulamog would drag his towering form toward those concentrations and those trusted landmarks would become tombs. Seagate. That's why Seagate was being attacked by the scions of the Eldrazi. They were the farthest tendrils of Ulamog's spread, reaching out, sensing for the concentrations of population, sensing concentrations of energy. No, not sensing, he thought. Tasting. Eily and the circle of eternal pilgrims closed in on them. They raised the iron chains and moved closer to Jace and Jory. Jory brandished her halberd, whipping it back and forth. It was not a time for subtlety. Jace walked straight up to one of the pilgrims who was in his way, a human with gray stubble. In Ula's name, I... The man reached forward to wrap Jace in chains. Stop. The man burst into flames. The man screamed. He dropped the chains and flailed, pawing at his body, trying to slap at the fire that suddenly engulfed him. It wouldn't go out. He dropped to the ground and rolled against the grass, but still it wouldn't go out. He moaned in agony. Jace looked around at all the eternal pilgrims, and they too erupted in flames. They shrieked in unison, all of them grabbing at themselves, trying to shed their flame-consumed robes, writhing on the ground or running in random directions. Jace and Jory were no longer surrounded. Which way out of here? Uh, uh, back into the chasm. We can climb back up the other face. As they raced back into the narrow fissure, Jory whispered at him. How? You're not a pyromancer? The important thing is they don't know that. Jory looked back. Over their shoulder, the pilgrims weren't on fire at all. They padded at their perfectly whole bodies, thrashing around in the grass for no reason. Jay saw her shoot him a look, and they ran on. Jace and Jory caught their breath. In the distance, Ulamog hauled itself forward in the direction of Seagate, carving its way through the landscape. The pilgrims hadn't strayed far from their object of worship. I had never seen a titan before. Neither had I. It had become clear to Jace what needed to happen, and he didn't like it. Now he had to break the news to Jory and hope she agreed. Well, we lost all our provisions on the coach. Jory... So I can hunt for us for the next few days, and I should be able to get us to the eye on foot. We'll have to ask for help with the crossing, and then there's the teeth of a coom, but I have friends among the Tuk-Tuk goblins who may be able to help. Jory, someone has to warn them. Warn who? The others, back at Seagate. Ulamog is headed right for them. Gideon has to know what's coming. And abandon our expedition to the Eye? You can't just... tell him? From here? It's too far for telepathy. You could just... return... Right now, you're one of those. I'm not doing that. So what? We just head back? 
Jory's neck fins wrinkled. She turned away for a moment, toward the horizon, but then faced him again. All right. Yes, we'll turn around, head back as fast as we can, and we'll prepare for a fight at the encampment. You go. What? Go back and warn them. I'm going to the Eye. You're going on alone? Jace, no! It's what has to happen. But you'll never make it! I have to. But then there's only one of you. I won't let you go alone, unprovisioned, unprepared. I'll have my illusions to keep me company. Not funny. Come on, you're coming back to Seagate with me. Jace wondered if she knew her hand had involuntarily touched her halberd. You're going to drag me back with you? If I have to! I thought you might say something like that. Jace backed away. He had to consider every possibility. Goodbye, Jory. Wait! Jace! Wait! No! Jory shook her head and looked around. The encampment wasn't far now. Another day's hike would have her back there to warn them. She had made good time without the tenderfoot mind mage to slow her down. It had only been a few days since she had convinced Jace... Right? Yes! yes. She furrowed her brow. Yes. yes! Since she had convinced him to go to the Eye without her, it had been the smartest option. He just needed to see the bigger picture. She stopped hiking. What had she just been saying to herself? Wait, Wait Jace, Jace, no? no? She scanned around, feeling like she needed to get her bearings. The sky above her was as it had been for the past several days, broad and blue and peppered with clouds and the occasional floating hedron, limitless and familiar and yet somehow odd. She felt an unsettling sensation, as if the dome of sky had just somehow bent into a new shape, suddenly and just outside her field of vision. She swiveled her head around. The grass and stones and distant trees all looked as they should. She looked at a stone on the ground. She kicked it. God damn it, Jace! She heaved a breath and shook her head. She adjusted a strap on her armor and walked on. On toward Seagate. Thank you for listening to this production of Voice of All. As listener-supported entertainment, we rely on you not just for the voices of the characters, but also to keep us going and growing. If you enjoyed what you heard, please support us by rating and reviewing us on iTunes, or following us on SoundCloud, Stitcher, and Google Play, or just plain sharing with your friends. You can also support us financially on Patreon for exclusive perks. The Believer's Pilgrimage was written by Doug Byer. The podcast was produced and edited by Gin Dokeshi, with sound editing by Christina Edelman. This week's story featured the voice talents of Isa Martell, David Ford, Ash Thurman, Sarah Brown, Alexander Lulla, Ryan Yoshitani, Gamer Dragon, Rhythm Bastard, Scott Williamson, and Tsukino Kage. Voice of All is unofficial fan content permitted under the Wizards of the Coast fan content policy. Magic the Gathering is copyright. Wizards of the Coast. Thank y'all so much for listening. Y'all have a great day, okay? <laughs>